Hey guys, welcome to episode number 564. Today is Monday, so it's update Monday. And today we are taking a full fish room tour. That's right, it's been a while since we've done one of these, but I think it's time that we take a quick spin and look at everything all in one video. But before we get started, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can watch more videos like this in the future. Also, if you'd like to help support this channel, you can go check out myaquariumbox.com. All right, we've got a lot to look at down here, so let's get started. So come along with me and learn how to be a better aquarist. All right, here we are, December 2018, full fish room update and tour. This place is back in shape after a long summer of outdoor projects. Now we've got a lot of stuff indoors that we've been working on. Still in love with the 300 gallon turtle stock tank here. Uh, we've done plenty of videos on this in the past. Uh, one thing to note is I did switch back to my mercury vapor bulb because unfortunately the HID bulb um, the ballast blew out when uh, the circuit breaker tripped in the house. So silly me, uh, I didn't protect that light and it's already gone. So <laughs> uh, I'll have to um, update this in the future. But for now we've got our mercury vapor bulb back in place on the basking surface. We do have nine southern black knob map turtles in this 300 gallon Rubbermaid stock tank. They do love to hide underneath the driftwood and they will not come out for anyone or anything, not even food. So unfortunately, we're not gonna get too many good uh, images of them here, but hopefully we can get some GoPro footage and uh, you can get a little bit better of a close up uh, of these guys. I do love these guys, they are awesome. So hopefully, um, with nine of them here, I can get a good breeding group going. You can see we've got the, uh, the basking spot and the breeding box over here. Hopefully we can get a good uh, breeding group going and get some eggs here relatively shortly. They're about full grown size. So here is their nesting box. This is just a mix of, um, oh, it's like a mix of sand and, um, uh, peat moss, I think, like a 50-50 mix of sand and peat moss. So it does retain moisture and uh, it's easy to dig. And this is just two uh, bins that have been zip tied together with the bottom cut off of one. And uh, that gives me a good place for them to hang out, bask, lay eggs. That's the hope anyways. So that is the 300 gallon stock tank. Now, as we move over here, we've got the 50 gallon Rubbermaid down here. This is the Fiddler Crab tank. Uh, we do have, I believe, like five or six Fiddler Crabs left in here. They're hanging out. And I recently added all of these mangroves to this tank. Uh, I haven't dug any of these mangroves up yet to see if the roots have started to form. So I'm hoping that within the next few weeks, these will start to send off uh, leaves and we'll start to see some growth from the tips of these mangroves. But uh, the red mangrove, they start by growing the roots first before they start um, growing upwards with the leaves. So hopefully, crossing my fingers, we'll start to get some leaves in here soon. Um, this is a very simple tank. It's not even heated. I have a, just a sponge filter and an air stone in there. Uh, I did add some salt to here. So uh, what I do is I come by and spray all of these down maybe once a week just to get the salt off of them. But that is the Fiddler Crab tank. Up here, we have our Betta Barracks for our fry rack. This is version 2.0 that I recently uh, completed in a recent video. So if you wanna go see that, go check out some of my recent videos. 
Uh, again, we've got the big three inch PVC pipe acting as a trough and we've got uniseals going through the side and then all of that drains into my uh, turtle filtration system. So the biggest benefit to this um, is that even though these are very small containers, uh, these marina hang on breeder boxes, very small containers, it's utilizing the filtration capacity and the water volume of this entire system here. So um, that is huge. So uh, it gets heat, it gets water um, through that system. Now, there are three sizes for the Marina hang on breeder boxes. Uh, this is a small, this is a medium, and this is a large. And I'm doing some experiments to see ultimately long term which size uh, I want to work with on this rack system. And we do have two betta fish in here as temporary homes. This one is in a small marina breeder box. And this is an experiment, 100%. Uh, obviously, this is a much smaller water volume than uh, a betta fish should live in. And, um, you know, like I said, it's getting filtration through the entire turtle tank system. So it, it's, it's deceptively small um, when you consider that, but um, just, you know, for quality of life, obviously we're gonna get this guy into a bigger tank. I just wanna see for a few weeks for short term use um, if a small marina breeder box will work with betta fish. So as you guys have seen in previous videos, we've got a uh, half inch water line here with our valves connected to it. And these are running each one of these breeder boxes. So we're getting a drip of water into each one of these breeder boxes, and then they're overflowing there into the back. So it's a very cool system here. Uh, for right now, we've got the betta fish here. We've got one here, and we've got one here. And then uh, on these bottom two rows, we just have some uh, plants, some spare plants. I picked up these small, um, like silicone uh, basters. Uh, I wasn't able to get a full-size turkey baster in here. There's just not enough room. So I got these miniature ones and they're actually working out pretty well just to siphon and suck up all the debris on the bottoms of these breeder boxes. Uh, and I do that about once a week. But you can see um, there is debris that does build up on the bottoms of these. And one thing that I wanted to do when I designed this rack was make it really easy to clean these and to scrub them down, refill them, and set them back up. So uh, ultimately, if these got really gross and I just wanted to do like 100% water change and clean it all out, all I would have to do is shut the valve there to shut the water off. I can just pull this piece off and then I can grab this just like a specimen container and I can go dump it out clean it out in the sink and then put it right back in and set it right back up. So really simple, really easy way to keep a lot of these going without needing to do uh, a whole lot of maintenance. Now the top two shelves have some inhabitants as well, uh, mainly crayfish. We've got our self-cloning crayfish, um, I'm a crab crayfish. And there's three of them on this row that are actually buried females. So they have eggs, they're carrying eggs. None of them are going to show us the eggs that they're carrying. But my hope is in a future video, um, when the babies hatch, I'll be able to catch them in the act and there'll be a, a mama crayfish and there'll be like 50 babies all over the place in these breeder boxes and we'll be able to uh, get that on video. So hopefully that happens and uh, when it does, you'll see it in a future video. So that's what I've got in here for now. Uh, I do plan on using these for a variety of different purposes and uh, for now I just wanted to fill them up, get stuff in them before I actually utilize them uh, for real breeding purposes. I was thinking of utilizing some of these for 
my Andler's live bearers because um, you know when they drop fry, it's good to have um, a place for all of those to start out in. Now, so far I haven't done any selective breeding on my Andler colony. This is a 40 gallon breeder full of Endler's live bearers. There's hundreds of them in here. And uh, all you need to do is give them plenty of uh, floating plants. In this case, I've got the fake boxwood garland. And they do really well in here. They don't really predate on their fry at all. Um, but in a colony breeding situation, you can't really select for certain characteristics like uh, heavy red or heavy green um, coloration. So maybe I can get into some selective breeding if I uh, utilize the breeder boxes. But those are the endlers. Over here we have some Amica Splendens that I picked up at a recent auction. Uh, they have not produced any fry for me to date. I haven't really tried a whole lot with them. There are a few small endlers in there with them. Um, and funny enough, whatever I do, uh, endlers seem to make their way into all the other tanks in this system. It's a little bit of a problem, and uh, I could go into it, but essentially <laughs> what happens is some of them manage to get over the overflows, go all the way through my filtration system, get pumped back up through my return pump, and then they get pumped into different tanks. So um, if you see a stray endler or two in any of these tanks, it had to go through that harrowing journey in order to get there. So every once in a while I scoop them up and throw them back in the mother colony here. But for now, um, we've got this group of fish, not really producing, but uh, they seem fat and healthy. So um, not too worried about that. Down here we've got a few experiments going on, uh, but we do have some quarry cats. You can see some adults, and we've also got some babies. Uh, the babies were raised in this tank, which is really exciting. Uh, it seems like if you feed these guys really good, they will lay tons of eggs on the glass, and then all you need to do is scrape those up, throw them in a breeder box, and some of them will hatch and survive. So happy with that. I haven't really gone into uh, a whole lot of effort with breeding them, so I only have two or three babies out of this uh, group, but um, we do have some Mexican mollies in here as well. There's a male there, small male, and there's a couple females back there. Actually, the big one's a male with the uh, the color on the back of the fin. That's a male, the other one's a female. Uh, this colony has reproduced, but they haven't really exploded. Um, so I think I started with about a uh, half dozen, and I probably have a half dozen right now. It's like second or third generation at this point. So again, you know, when you're not specifically trying to breed some of these fish, they don't always do the best at breeding so um, obviously I've got a mix of other things in here I've got a uh, bristle nose pleco I've got the quarry cats so they're not isolated and they're not set up um, for success here but I do want to bring some of these fish outdoors in the greenhouse in the spring and really try to set them up for optimal success with breeding so if they can hang in through the winter maybe this is uh, one of the fish that I bring outside Anyways, that's that tank. Over here, we've got a bunch of bristlenose plecos. These are babies. Again, I got them at a recent auction. Some are normals. There's also some albinos in here. A lot of them are probably carrying the albino gene as well. But I just try to load this thing up with driftwood. And uh, you can see we've got the GoPro in there right now, I'm trying to get some footage. But uh, yeah, just load this thing up with driftwood, load it up with caves, and then load it up with food as well. So I try to feed these guys either squash or cucumber and um, you know other algae-related 
dietary items and uh, they are growing rapidly and I've actually started to move these guys into some of my other tanks. So I've tried to put at least one bristle nose pleco in every 40 gallon breeder tank that I have except for the ones that have crayfish in them. Um, so hopefully, you know, once these guys grow out a little bit more, I'll try to put um, like a small breeding group, maybe like one male and one female uh, in every tank with a pleco cave. And hopefully I can get some babies. So that's that tank there. Uh, these guys are all alone. There's nothing else in this tank except for those plecos. Um, they're a little skittish, so I want them to all get a chance to eat and not get disturbed by other fish. So that is a look at this side of the fish room. Lots of stuff going on. Well, let's go take a quick peek at the other side of the fish room and we can talk a little bit more about some of the projects I have going on. Now, um, this is the vacuum, the whole fish room vacuum system. And uh, if you want to go check out one of my other recent videos, we built this thing. It worked. It didn't work uh, 100%. And the, if you go watch that video, one of the things I noted in that video is that um, essentially what, what you do is you turn the vacuum on and you've got suction pressure. This entire 55 gallon barrel becomes a vacuum chamber, just like a shop vac basically. Uh, but we're sucking water in here. And we've got a sump pump down below so when the water rises it gets pumped out. So as long as this hose is completely empty, when I turn this on and put this wand in a tank, we get a great vacuum, we get great suction, just like if you were siphoning directly into a barrel. But the piece that I was missing on my first attempt was the shutoff valve here. And essentially what this is is just a small ball valve. And what I um, was missing was when I originally shot the video and I tested this out, I didn't have this, so it was just completely open. And when I moved this wand from tank to tank, um, this hose started to empty with water. And at that point, I lost my suction. And the vacuum itself wasn't strong enough to pull all of the water out of this hose. So then I became basically siphon locked and it, w it stopped working. So the solution to that is when I'm done vacuuming one tank, all I have to do is shut that off and all of the water stays in the hose, I can move this to the next tank and then I open it up and it works just fine. So I've been really happy with that. This is the primary vacuum system that I've been using uh, in my tanks and uh, I'm happy to report that with the addition of that, it works just fine. Again, the biggest thing is just to make sure this entire tube is completely empty of all water before you start because once you get it going, then it works really well. But if you're starting and stopping, um, you can lose your siphon or get siphon locked. So that is the whole um, fish room vacuum system. You may also note that we've got a nice piece of plywood here, painted white, and uh, this is like three quarter inch plywood. And I had to replace this, I had to put this, I had to create this piece of plywood here to replace my twin wall polycarbonate that I had tried to sandwich together and glue together. You'll notice how warped this is. This was completely flat before I turned the vacuum on. So if you want to understand the power of a vacuum, it was able to basically warp this doubled up twin wall polycarbonate just by turning the vacuum on. So uh, the walls of this barrel are obviously fine. Um, the biggest place where that pressure is being felt is on this flat surface on the top. So you can imagine just the, the atmospheric pressure pushing down on this um, the top of this barrel that's where a lot of that pressure is being felt. So now that we've got the three quarter inch plywood there, everything's a-okay. This is getting tossed in the trash and uh, 
we'll just keep using this. So super happy with this. One thing to note is a little project that I want to work on next year, and that is a fully automatic brine shrimp hatchery. Now, you guys have seen this system, this brine shrimp hatchery system. Um, I use it off and on. It depends on what fish I'm breeding and you know what they require in terms of nutrition. And right now I'm not utilizing this at all. But it's always nice to have live food down in the fish room. And so I've thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could create fully automatic brine shrimp hatchery? Something that takes all of the ingredients, the eggs, the salt, um, mixes everything together, allows it all to hatch, separates everything, cleans itself, resets itself, so that I don't have to manually fill these up and um, manage them every single day. Brine shrimp is a very labor intensive animal to hatch and feed. And so I was thinking if I could create some sort of fully automatic system to do all of that for me, and just like a, you know, like a Keurig coffee machine, I just come down here in the morning and I just grab a jar full of baby brine shrimp that have hatched um, and I can feed those to my fish and then I can put the jar back and then, you know, the next morning when I wake up, I've got more in that jar. How awesome would that be? Anyways, that's a little bit of a pipe dream at the moment, but it's one of the big projects that I want to tackle next year. You guys know I like to tackle at least one big project per year. That might be the one to do for 2019. Now, we got a lot of stuff sitting up here on this shelf. I'm not really sure uh, what I'm gonna do with this shelf long term. This used to be my algae growing shelf. I no longer really have a need for that. Um, I think if I'm gonna do any algae growing, it's probably gonna be outside in the greenhouse, but we do have a baby banana plant hanging out here. I got this from H2O Plants. Um, they do a lot of aquatic plants, but now they're doing some uh, terrestrial plants as well. So go check out H2O Plants on YouTube. Go check out Justin's recent video about banana plants. Um, he calls his Bruce, and I'm going to call mine Mini Bruce. So hopefully I can keep this banana plant alive through the winter because the goal is to put this back out in the greenhouse in the spring. And I might even try to do it uh, aquaponics style and allow some of the roots to be under water. So that would be very cool if I could get that to work. We've got some wild type crayfish in here. This is my colony that I saved from a crawfish boil a few years back. It's still going strong. Uh, we did have a little bit of breeding activity in here earlier in the day. And um, again, this is one of those colonies that just sort of self-regulates itself. Uh, I don't really have any more room to give these guys. If I did, they would just continue to overpopulate. And uh, as it is, essentially what happens is when this gets too crowded, they just start fighting and unfortunately sometimes there are casualties but um, I do try to give them plenty of hiding places uh, plenty of driftwood to hide out in and uh, they are relatively happy in here as long as it doesn't get too overcrowded and usually there's like one or two big males and then there's uh, like a half dozen females and that's enough to keep uh, the generations going from generation to generation. Now, down here we have just a plant tank for now. I don't really have anything else in this tank currently. I may put one of those betta fish in here uh, once I'm done my little experiments. But uh, essentially what we have here is a mix of floating plants. We've got some duckweed, we've got some uh, like dwarf water lettuce, and there's probably a few other things in there as well. I'm just trying to keep some of this alive through the winter so that I can put it back out in the greenhouse in the spring. Not great at keeping plants alive in these fish tanks, but I do have these uh, Marineland uh, planted LED lights. 
So hopefully uh, at least some of this will survive and we'll bring it back outside. All right, second to last tank. This is our marbled crayfish tank, the mammal crab self-cloning crayfish. This colony has exploded. And I think a large part of that is just due to how many um, coconut shells I've placed in this tank. They have a lot of space to hang out and to hide from one another. And uh, they don't get super aggressive and they are self-cloning, so um, there is no breeding that has to go on. Every one of these will carry eggs and they will self-clone and replicate. So um, you can imagine just a few of these will turn into hundreds of them uh, if we just give them enough time. We have plenty of hiding places in there, so they are doing very, very well. This is always a favorite if you go to fish clubs and fish auctions, bring a few of these and people will jump all over it because uh, all you need is one. All right, and the last tank here is uh, nothing special in terms of the fish. These are just a few goldfish that are wintering indoors instead of outdoors in the thousand gallon pond because uh, they were just a little too small uh, to start the winter out there. Uh, so I figured I'd give them a good start down here in the warmer water indoors and then move them outside. Now you'll notice this tank is completely empty of everything and it's actually one of the cleanest tanks that I have in the fish room. Uh, the entire bottom of this tank is almost spotless. You compare that to uh, like this crayfish tank, you can see there's debris all over the bottom of this tank. And part of that is because goldfish will just eat anything and everything. But another part of it is due to this little experiment that I'm running here. And this is a modified airlift uh, overflow tube. So I've got a few different um, styles of overflow. If I'm not concerned with any fry escaping, this is just the simplest and easiest one. Uh, it's just a little screen here that slips on the inside of this bulkhead and that's all you need. You just have to clean it off every once in a while. If we do have fry in a tank and we're scared that they're going to um, get swept out over the overflow and we don't want that to happen, this is the style of overflow that I use. And again, it uses this screen as like an emergency overflow, but what it has is a big sponge here and that allows all of the water to basically travel through that sponge and then out over the overflow and that works really well for keeping a lot of those baby fish in these tanks. But what it's not great for is all of the debris that accumulates on the bottoms of these tanks. And you guys know, I like to try to automate things as much as I can. I don't like having to uh, clean the bottoms of all these tanks every week because I've got an automatic water change system set up and I'd like to reduce the maintenance or make it as easy as possible. So this, is an experiment. This is an airlift overflow tube. Essentially what I've done is I've taken the same T here, I've used the same screen uh, here, but I've drilled a hole in the top, I added an airline, I pushed that all the way down, uh, I just used a you know PVC pipe, and then I took a little piece of the Gemco um, like screen material, uh, like tubular screen material, and a little piece of cloth, like netting, zip tied that on and, and made this basically um, a place where all the debris on the bottom of the tank that is starting to accumulate can get through and get sucked up into my overflow. 
So you notice some of this stuff is sort of hanging out or accumulating right underneath there. The stuff that's there is just a little too heavy to get sucked up. But every once in a while, when you see something that's floating by, uh, it will get sucked up into that airlift. So we've just got an air stone there, and the, uh, the airflow is set to, I don't know, about medium. I can crank that up as high as I want. Um, we just don't want it sort of bubbling and boiling over the emergency overflow up there. But what it's doing is it's pulling all of the water and all of the debris from the bottom of the tank, which is my problem area, all of the debris is just hanging out on the bottoms of these tanks. And it's, it's giving it a place to go. It's pulling it up here, bringing it up over the overflow, um, and through the bulkhead, and then into my central filtration system. If I'm going to clean something on a weekly basis, I would rather have it just be like a, a big sponge pad in one place in my first mechanical filter barrel. I don't want to have to siphon all the tanks if I don't have to. So I'm thinking that this is something that I could use to help speed that process up. Now, I would not be able to use something like this on a tank that has fry, but I would be able to use it on any tank that I'm currently just using uh, like an overflow screen like this. So you will notice that the water level on this tank is quite a bit lower than all of the other tanks. And that's actually because of this airlift. So usually the water level is gonna be at the same level as the bulkhead, but here you can see the water level is actually lower than the bulkhead. And that's because the, uh, the negative pressure that this uh, airlift is causing is actually allowing the water level in here to drop because that water is actually being pumped out through that bulkhead. But I've got a place for the air to escape up here and uh, I've got a place for the excess water to escape <laughs> if I was to crank this all the way up. And so this is actually working really, really well to keep this tank specifically quite a bit cleaner than all of the other tanks. So this is the experiment. Uh, let me know what you guys think about it, but if, if all things check out here, I might be doing this to a lot more of my 40 gallon breeders just to cut down on the maintenance. Anyways, guys, that is the full tour of the fish room. Quite a bit going on down here, I know. Uh, we do have quite a few more projects in store, but this was the full look at everything that I've got going on down here. So hope you guys enjoyed the tour. All right, guys, and that's gonna do it for this week's video. We had a lot of fun taking a tour, a full tour of the basement fish room. It's taken me a few weeks to get it set back up and running at full capacity here, but I think it's doing really well. We've got a good selection of different fish in all of our different tanks, and everything is happy, healthy, really well fed and doing fantastic. So that's the fish room, that's what's going on. We've got a lot more to do down here, a lot of DIY projects in the near future. So we will definitely start tackling those in next week's video. Until then guys, make sure you have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday season. Go give your fish a treat. Um, it is the season, so they certainly deserve it. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you wait, we'll have some parting clips, some underwater video from the GoPro, so you can watch that as you drink your eggnog and spend time, hopefully, with your family. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later.